Prologue. If you ask folks around here what they remember about the year 1944, a child might say, that was the year my daddy went off to fight Hitler. A mother might look towards Baker's Mountain and whisper that polio snatched up one of her youngins. And the Hickory Daily Record will say that my hometown gave birth to a miracle. If anyone knows about those things, it's me and Faye Honeycutt for sure. But if you ask me what I remember, I will say it was the year I put on overalls and became the man of the house. It was the summer that Wisteria turned enemy on me and I made best friends with a colored girl. It was the fall when Franklin D. Roosevelt was elected to his fourth term in office. I will say it was the time in my life when I learned that all of us are as fragile as a mimosa blossom, but I also learned that it mostly hurts at first. Chapter 1. The War Hits Home. January 1944. My family huddled together on the railroad platform, but we wasn't huddling to get out of the January wind. We was all trying to keep stay close to Daddy, like that would keep him home somehow. At the end of the platform, under a sign that said coloreds, a Negro family was doing the same thing. That's when it hit me how much colored people was just like us. Daddy took my chin and made me look right at him. I expect you to be the man of the house while I'm gone, he said. He handed me a pair of blue overalls. You've been wanting a pair of britches ever since you first climbed that apple tree. I reckon this is your chance. Daddy ran his finger over the old hickory label on the front of them overalls. See, they was made right here in Hickory, North Carolina. I knew Daddy would expect me to act like a lady if he was staying home. When I turned 13, he started telling me it was time to learn something from my mama and quit tagging after him all the time. Now he was telling me to wear britches, which should have made me happy, but wearing britches so I could take the place of Daddy wasn't the same as wearing them so I could climb trees. I knew I had to do my part for the war, but was this my part, sending Daddy off to fight while I planted the peas? Don't look so downhearted, Daddy said. Your old mom always said I spit you right out of my mouth, so you might as well go ahead and take my place for a while. I took a long look at my Daddy and his dimpled chin and his black hair and blue eyes. I soaked up the look of him, tall and solid, under his new uniform. I knew I looked just like him, and ever since I could walk, I had chased after him like a train following a railroad track. It didn't matter if he was cutting a hickory branch to make a handle for a shovel or planting a board for a nightstand for Mama. I was right there picking up the curly wood shavings and poking them in his ears. Daddy always said he had to go hide in the Johnny house if he wanted to get a minute without me. And now, here I was sending him off to fight Hitler. I threw my arms around him and sucked in the smell of his cigarettes and hair tonic. I hung on tight and felt his heart beating in my chest. Or was it my heart? After he tore himself away, he picked up my six-year-old sisters, Ida and Ellie, one at a time. He rubbed noses with the twins like he had done every morning when he went to work and said, like always, now don't you be growing up on me while I'm gone. If it was an ordinary day, they would have teased him back. Just watch, we're going to get big when you ain't looking. But today we didn't have the heart for Daddy's games, and I didn't blame them. Daddy was going off to fight the meanest man in the world, and we all knew good and well we might have to all grow up without him. Then Daddy picked up my four-year-old brother. Why did you give them overalls to Ann Faye? asked Bobby. I thought I was going to be the man of the house. Bobby, said Daddy, you're the only man-child I got, but you're just a little man. I expect you to help Mama and Ann Faye, but you got to take some time to play every day. Daddy ruffled Bobby's brown curls and added, now that's my opinion and it's worth two cents. And just like that, he reached in his pocket and pulled out two pennies. He put one in each of Bobby's chubby hands. Bobby didn't say nothing about no overalls after that. Then Daddy put his hands so tender around Mama's head and buried his face in her shiny brown hair, like he was sucking in all of her smells. He whispered her name and that's all he said. Myrtle. Like just saying her name would tell her everything else in his heart. She laid her head up against his chest and fingered the muscle in his arms. I thought how I knew the exact feel of his muscles under her fingers, too. I knew the ache in her heart, too. Bobby was hanging on to both of their legs. Ida and Ellie hugged each other and cried. All of a sudden, my family seemed so broke apart. I wanted in the worst way to squeeze us all into Daddy's truck and let him drive us out into the country. But just then, the conductor blew his whistle and called, All aboard! 
Oh, Leroy, my mama said. Her voice cracked and I felt a stab of pain in my throat. Daddy squeezed her one last time and let her go real slow, in a way that seemed like he was really hanging on to her. I think I seen tears in his eyes, but he turned quick and almost run to that truck. Train. I looked for him to wave out the window, but he never did, so I knew for sure he was crying. Down at the other end of the platform, I seen that colored daddy in his uniform getting on the train, too. I'll tell you what, the sight of them two daddies, the colored daddy and my white one, leaving their woman and children at the exact same time, was like the beginning of a journey for me. I didn't go anywhere, really, but it was never in the same place after that, either. The train let go of one last big puff of steam and wailed out of the station. Bobby started up howling right along with it. Mama held her hand over his mouth and said, Hush now, sugar. Daddy will be back before you know it. About that time, a man started towards us. He was dressed in a black suit with a hat to match, and he had the kindest eyes, which put me in the mind of Daddy. The man put his hand in his pocket, and the next thing I knew, he was prying my brother's fists open and putting a nickel in each of his little wet hands with his wet little pennies. There now, he said. I bet if you buy yourself a root beer, you'll feel better in no time. Well, I reckon Bobby had never had a whole dope to himself. He swiped his fat white cheeks with the back of his fist and gulped back to his tears and didn't say a word. Ida whined. How come Bobby's getting all the money? Ellie echoed right after her. Yeah, how come? The man laughed and pulled three more nickels out of his pocket. He started handing them to us girls. But Mama wasn't used to taking money from strangers. Sir, she said, my girls didn't mean to beg. Of course they didn't, said the man, but I want to give it. There's a war on and we all have to share. Then he pulled a $5 bill out of his pocket. While you're at the store, pick up some meat for your supper tonight. The ration board says we can buy pork again. I hope you have some ration coupons. I reckon the man saw that Mama could use the money, but I didn't think she'd take it. She shook her head and said, I do have coupons, but I can't take your money. The man laughed softly. For these little ones, you can. I have a child, too, he said, so I know how you love them. He shook the bill gently and said, I can't serve in the war, but I like to support those who can. Mama must elect his argument because she took the five dollars. I don't know how to thank you, she said. The man winked at me and patted the twins' blonde curls before he walked away. Then we walked to the parking lot where our neighbor, Junior Bledsoe, was waiting for us in Daddy's truck. Junior was 17 years old. He's the man of his house, too, ever since his daddy's heart gave out a few years ago. Junior and his mama didn't have a car or truck, and my mama don't have a driver's license. So Daddy gave his pickup to Junior to use while he's gone, as, Ju- as long as Junior looks after us. While Junior would do, any ha- would do anyhow on account of that's just how he is. He's got a big heart for one thing, not to mention he dearly loves being in charge. When we were driving away from the train station, we seen the man give Mama the money. That's when I knew why he couldn't serve in the war, and why he got that softness in his voice when he talked about his child. Him and his wife was pushing a wheelchair with the girl in it. She must have been about the same age as Ida and Ellie. She had braces on both legs, which was real skinny, and I knew the minute I saw her what was wrong. Oh, my Lord, I said. His little girl's got the infantile paralysis. What's that? asked Deli. Polio, said Junior. That's what President Roosevelt had. I thought how Daddy had told me if Franklin Roosevelt could be crippled and still get himself elected president, then I could handle any hard thing that got thrown on me. Since Daddy said it, I knew it was true. But with him gone, I wasn't feeling so sure, and seeing that girl with polio put another sadness all over me. We stopped at the fresh air market and bought a whole dough beach. Mama bought one for Junior, too, and she gave us each a dime with the man's money to put in a little box on the counter. The box had a label that said March of Dimes. The dimes would go to the president so he could help other people with polio. Some people can't breathe when they get polio, said Junior. They have to lay in an iron lung with nothing but their head sticking out. It's like a big barrel that does the breathing for them. Sometimes I wish Junior Bledsoe didn't feel so obligated to tell everything he knows. You'd think at a time like this he could see we was all in need of hearing something more cheerful. Going home just made me feel worse. The first thing I seen was the flag hanging in the front window. It had a blue star on it to show that 
there was a, this was a soldier's house. But I couldn't bear to look at it just then, so I went around to the back porch. I sat on the cold concrete step, rocking myself and praying Daddy would walk out of the Johnny house any minute. I told myself maybe he didn't really go to war. Maybe he just needed a break from me. I heard a little rattle, like the sound of a latch lifting from the outhouse. But it was just a family of seed pods hanging left over and lonely in the mimosa tree. When the wind blew, they made a sad, clattery sound. I looked past the mimosa to the pines, all covered in wisteria vines. And even that vine, which I dearly love, made me sad for Daddy. Wisteria is the only thing me and Daddy ever argue about. I say the flower is purple, and he says that it's blue. I tell him I don't see how anyone can hate a flower that's so beautiful and smells so sweet. Daddy says he don't understand how anyone could love a vine that wraps itself around every limb on a tree like it wants to choke the life out of it. Last summer, he declared war on the wisteria on account of its making its way towards our garden. First, he cut every single wisteria vine about ten feet. Then, he dug a ditch between it and the garden. There, he said, I dare that menace to come across my ditch. If you destroy Wisteria Mansion, me and Peggy Sue are going to be mad, I said. Peggy Sue is my best friend. When we was nine years old, Daddy helped us clear big space under the pine trees and out the garden. We made a mansion with different rooms. It got to be the most beautiful spot in the world, with the sunlight making lacy shadows on the brown pine needle floor. The walls are all green from the pine trees in Wisteria except for a few weeks in April when they're full of purple blossoms that hang like a bunch of grapes and smell so sweet it nearly knocks you over. When Daddy declared war on the wisteria, I was afraid he'd kill it off, but he said he couldn't kill it if he tried. And Faye, he said, that vine is just like you. It might be pretty, but it's also determined. It would take a very powerful, strong enemy to destroy either one of you. I wanted to believe him, but now that Daddy was off to fight a real world, I felt destroyed already.